Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on time. We're going to give a couple of minutes just to allow folks to come in from the waiting room. I'll rejoin you in, in two minutes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for, for being here. Uh, my name is Maria Estorino, and I am the Associate University Librarian for Special Collections at the Wilson Library, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Libraries. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, we have a, a three-hour program planned, but we know that you may be with us for part of the morning or for the whole morning, whatever your time with us is today. We welcome you here and we welcome um, your participation. Uh, I'm going to um, share screen to kick us off. And um, I wanna say that um, thank th you are joining us today for Finding Baldwin, an exploration of identity and belonging in the archives. We at the university libraries are so happy to be presenting this workshop with the Institute for the Arts and Humanities as part of their 2022 Mary Stevens Reckford Lecture in European Studies, for which Magdalena Zaborowska will discuss between home, blackness, and me, unsettling locations, lives, and archives in American literary studies on February 24th. I want to give a special thanks to Patricia Parker, who is the director of the Institute, and to her team for inviting us to be part of this programming and for being here today, I see some of them in the Zoom room. Thank you. In her book, Me and My House, James Baldwin's Last Decade in France, Magdalena Zaborowska asks why it is that there is no museum or archive dedicated to Baldwin. While she was researching and writing this book, this was indeed the case. Soon thereafter, two things happened. In September 2016, the National Museum of African American History and Culture opened. And in 2020, they collaborated with Dr. Zaborowska in the development of this digital exhibition, Shea Baldwin, that explores his life and works through the lens of his house in the south of France. And in April 2017, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture at the New York Public Library acquired James Baldwin's personal archives. While these developments in part answer Zaborowska's question, why is there no museum or archive dedicated to Baldwin, they leave the reader with many other questions about how archives are constructed and why. When the Institute for the Arts and Humanities invited us to create a program related to this year's Reckford lecture around the theme of identity and belonging, we thought of this framework in two ways. First is the question of who belongs in the archives and who finds themselves in the archives. But second is the question of how our own individual identities impact our professional practice, how the archivists or librarians identity shape the work of building the archives, describing them and providing access to them. Most definitions of archives will tell you that they are, the collection, they are collections of records in various forms and formats, the institutions responsible for those records, and the places where they are housed, like Wilson Library. By focusing today on identity and belonging, we are foregrounding an essential component of the archives, and that is the people who work in them. Into the 20th century, archives were upheld as impartial, neutral, objective, passive, 
sometimes handmaidens to history. Over the past two decades, critical archival studies have focused our attention on the power of archives and how they are used to control the past and protect the position of the powerful in society. Sorry, just got to share my screen. <laughs> Much of that power rests in the hands of archivists and librarians who make hundreds of decisions that impact what is selected for the archives, how it's described, who can access the archive and under what circumstances, and which records are used to shape history, laws, and society's views of the past and the present. Archival studies scholars Joan Schwartz and Terry Cook note that archivists continually reshape, reinterpret, and reinvent the archives. Archives then are not passive storehouses of old stuff, but active sites where social power is negotiated, contested, confirmed. If critical archival studies have turned archivists and librarians towards frameworks of power, feminist theory has also pointed us toward radical empathy and ethics of care in our work. As outlined in the scholarship of Michelle Caswell and Monica Sefor, this approach positions archivists as caregivers bound to records, creators, subjects, users, and communities through a web of mutual effective responsibility. We hope that today's workshop will provide insights into how we librarians and archivists negotiate these frameworks of power, empathy, and care as professionals and as individuals, and to generate critical conversation about the layers of meaning of archival work and its impact. Thank you again so much for joining us today for this exploration and this conversation. And so now it is my great pleasure to turn the program over to Shaitra Powell, who is curator of the Southern Historical Collection here at Wilson Library, who will be guiding us through today's workshop. Shaitra. Thank you, Maria. And welcome to everyone who's joining us this morning. We're really excited to talk to you about our work in the archives and um, its connections to some of the themes that Maria discussed earlier. Um, I would like to just start to, to explain how um, when we were developing this program, one of my goals was to try to help our users see archives in a 360 degree way. And so um, that's how we've arrived at these three presenters that are gonna look at the way archives are collected, the way they're described and the way they're accessed. And that is really a core function of a library and how do our identities and notions of belonging impact that. So um, I'm here to kind of facilitate the day and offer a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, I think the morning's gonna go by really fast. We have three 30 minute presentations with five minute breaks in between. And the last segment is about an hour for our panel and uh, Q and A. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. I'll be tracking them. Um, and we'll, if you have them, in real time, I'll track them. If you have them and you can hold them, you can also use the chat during the Q&A in the panel. Um, I'll also be the timekeeper to make sure that we stay on time. And uh, I think that's the extent of the housekeeping items. Um, we, are, we are right on time, which is great. Uh, I wonder, oh, I'm so sorry. Let me tell you <laughs> about the three presenters that are coming. Um, so first we'll have Liz Ott, who is our rare books curator here in Wilson Library, um, followed by Don Lucas, who is um, a technical services archivist here in the library. And um, we'll conclude with Aaron Smithers, who is our uh, one of our reference and instructional librarians. So they'll talk to you a little bit more about what they do. And, uh, and I'll be there at the end um, to facilitate the Q&A. Okay. Liz, are you ready to kick us off? Oh, we're gonna unmute. I am ready. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Nadia, can you start the slides? Great. So um, I wanted to begin today um, by 
Can we go to the next one, the quotation? I wanted to begin today by uh, talking about this um, particular line that is from the book, Me and My House, uh, that is the basis for the Retford lecture. This is, uh, when I was reading it, this is the line that stuck out to me and it was one of those moments where you just feel a connection um, to the work that you do so intensely and it makes you re-examine your practices and your thoughts around something. And uh, she asks, how is it one may ask that Baldwin's House Library has been abandoned as worthless while the Beinecke Library at Yale cherishes Walt Whitman's reading glasses as a precious artifact? Um, and uh, we don't have Walt Whitman's reading glasses at Wilson Library, but we do have these sort of objects of veneration. I was immediately um, called to mind uh, Robert Frost's walking stick is an item in the collection. And it's something that we still pull out and show to classes. We, we've put it on exhibit. Um, it's something that still is in some ways venerated. And yet, when I think about our contemporary collecting practices, I don't think that we would collect another writer's walking stick. And in fact, we've developed policies since the uh, decision to acquire Robert Frost's walking stick that we try not to collect objects um, of, of that variety. Um, so what does that mean for moving forward uh, and collecting, collecting around literary figures? Does it mean that um, for our researchers and patrons, we send a message that Robert Frost's memorabilia is worthy of inclusion in the archive, but that other writers are not. Um, so in thinking about that, I wanted to kind of walk through some of the ways that legacies of collecting continue to impact our decisions and how we think about moving forward with, with collection development activities. Can we go to the next slide? So one thing that I kind of wanted to begin with is just to talk about this. Uh, when we say, why are these items here? Where is here? We tend to talk about archives or special collections or the archive as though it's a monolithic concept. But uh, in fact, if we start looking at where archival repositories are located, we begin to realize that that's gonna have a huge impact on what kinds of collections have historically been collected and what kinds of collections that institution will pursue in the future. So I've listed out here just some of the places, the institutional types where archives are located. And even within the category of like colleges and universities, once you start to look at individual institutions, there's a big difference between uh, the research and teaching mission of say a small liberal arts college and a public university. A private institution like an Ivy League institution is going to have a different context for collecting than a historically black college and university. And even within some of these broader categories, we might break it down even further. So a flagship state uh, institution might have a much larger and more robust collecting program than some of the satellite locations. Um, and then that's not even getting into some of the other categories where we find archival repositories that could include independent research libraries. So places like the Huntington Library, the Folger Shakespeare Library, the Morgan uh, government libraries. The Library of Congress is a major repository in the United States, but there are many other government bodies that have important archives, medical and legal repositories, public libraries. Uh, the um, Baldwin Archive eventually ended up at the Schomburg, which is part of the New York Public Library. We might also think about the Enoch Pratt Library in Baltimore um, or the Free Library of Philadelphia. There are major collections that are part of public library systems. And then finally, voluntary community libraries, which have a much, much different relationship to their communities and their collections than some of these more institutional type repositories. Can we go to the next slide? And then the second question that I wanna kind of insert into this is this question of, well, how did these collections get here? What are the primary ways that institutions um, bring things in? And I've broken it down into three categories. One is gifts or donations, purchases, and then transfers. Uh, and the thing that I wanna point out about all three of these pathways is that each of them is inflected in their own way with both historical legacies, but also with certain amounts of power and privilege that reflect institutional type. So for example, 
under gifts, you know, when we think about who is giving to repositories, it's typically donors have a relationship to the institution. So in the case of a university, it might be an alumni or they want to have a relationship with the institution. And I think that that's a really important thing to remember is that a, a gift or a donation is the forging of a relationship. And an example that I wanna insert into this to kind of point out what I mean is um, the collection of uh, Octavia Butler's papers at the Huntington Library. So the Huntington is a private research library in Pasadena. Octavia Butler grew up in Pasadena uh, but was not someone who was welcomed into the Huntington Library during her upbringing. And in fact, in her paper, she talks very eloquently about the occasions where she did interact with the Huntington and her feelings of being othered and out of place in that repository. Yet her decision to donate her papers there in part was to kind of reclaim that space as a space of privilege that she could now access as a signal of her own success as a writer. Um, but that decision has its own controversies. Um, people who study Butler were not necessarily happy that the Huntington received her papers because they are a very closed off institution compared to many other repositories. To access their collections, you need to be um, credentialed provide letters of reference and apply to be a reader. So the community that Butler grew up in that is just down the street from the Huntington Library still cannot access her papers, even though they are right down the road. Yet her decision to donate there reflects her desire to build a relationship with that institution. But in another way, I think we can think about the ways that um, differences in privilege and power amongst institutions are going to in some ways predetermine the types of collections that want to be part of that collection, if that makes sense as a formulation. So, you know, if you have lots of rich, wealthy alumni, you're going to get larger cash donations, which may in turn mean that you have more purchasing power, which brings us to the next category, which is purchases. Um, purchases can be come from allocations. So government or state institutions may have allocations of state funds. Um, they can also come from private endowments. And a lot of purchasing within an institutional context circles around um, private endowments. Endowments can be more or less restricted. And I think this is something we don't often talk about with uh, in regards to endowments, but they often reflect the values of the giver rather than necessarily the current values of the institution. So, you know, an endowment might be as, as open as saying this endowment is to be used to purchase library materials, or it can be incredibly restrictive. For example, there's an endowment that uh, is at part of the rare book collection that's for collecting materials related to dental history. It can only be used to collect dental history. It cannot be used to collect other types of materials. Um, and uh, so you can kind of see how over time that means that uh, we think of archivists or curators as having like a wide latitude and decisions around what they can collect. But some of these legacies of what we have accepted in the past may restrain us or um, create a scope that informs our collecting going forward. And then finally, transfers. I really want to, I'm really interested in transfers and how they um, collect our, uh, impact our collections, um, because in many ways they reflect both the history of an institution's collecting. So this would be uh, in a university context, the movement of collections that used to be part of circulating or general collections into a special collections context. They also reflect our changing values over time. So things that were seen as not rare or valuable are then seen as rare and valuable enough to move into special collections. And this is incredibly culturally um, inflected. So um, if we compare, say, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, to Howard University, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, UNC was a major buyer of Black literature in our general collections, contemporary literature. So um, authors like County Cullen or um, uh, Langston Hughes, you know, people who were publishing then were 
But if we look at Howard, Dorothy Porter, who was the curator there, saw these same contemporary authors as a building blocks for a black literature collection in special collections. And the legacy of that over time is that a lot of the books that are now rare um, and that we want to preserve have been um, destroyed through circulation at UNC. Fine exemplars at Howard, and it reflects those different institutions' values around what they saw as worthy of um, inclusion in special collections. Can go forward one. I want to talk a little bit more about the specific aspects of literary collections at UNC. Um, we are a major collector of literary collections, but primarily of print. And that's uh, largely the result of a bequest that we received in 1960 um, from a man named William Whitaker, who established a fund in the rare book collection to purchase rare books and manuscripts, and in particular, um, English and American literature. Whitaker was himself a book collector, and we also received his collections. And the bequest came with instructions to build his collections in the same way that he collected. And he was a very traditional belles lettres kind of collector. So he collected uh, authors like Charles Dickens, William Mapeace Thackeray, John Whittier Greenleaf, uh, John Greenleaf Whittier, and so on. Um, and that both the corpus of materials that we received from him, as well as this endowment, really shaped the types of writers that we saw as valuable and worthy of adding to the collection. Um, by contrast, we do not have um, a lot of significant archival collections, modern archival literary collections. There's just a handful of authors. Um, the major collections that we have would be Thomas Wolfe, Diane De Prima, uh, who is a beat writer uh, associated with the Beats Movement, Walker Percy, and playwright and UNC faculty member Paul Green. And it's interesting when I go and look into what we have collected that's outside of this sort of canon of white writers, we I often find that we have collected specific black writers because of their relationship to one of the white writers I just mentioned. So for example, we have pretty extensive print collections of Audre Lorde and Leroy Jones or Amiri Baraka because of their professional relationship with Diane De Prima, whose literary archive we hold. Similarly, we have some important collections related to Richard Wright because of Paul Green adapted Native Son for Broadway and was a professional colleague of Wright. Go forward one more. Um, when I go looking for Baldwin at UNC, I, I find a similar kind of story and I find some interesting moments of what we have valued and not valued. So um, UNC does not have a copy of the first edition of Go Tell It on the Mountain, but screen you'll see um, a picture of an advanced reader copy in a trial binding of Go Tell It on the Mountain. And we also have the Universal Library Edition, which is on the far right, published by Grosset and Dunlap. Um, so these three items that I have up here, images of the advanced reader copy, the first edition published by Alfred Knopf in 1953, and the Universal Library Edition, they're actually all bibliographically speaking the exact same text. They were printed from the same printing plates. And so there are no textual differences between these three. Um, or at least no major ones. They are, in fact, the exact same book inside. The difference is in their packaging. The advanced reader copy, and if you're not familiar with advanced reader copies, these are pre-publication copies that are sent to editors and reviewers so that they can write reviews for like the Times Literary Supplement or the New York Review of Books, things like that. Um, and they can sometimes have great textual differences between the first edition. And often they don't, often they're identical, as is the case with Go Tell It on the Mountain. The only real difference is that uh, Knopf had designed this um, cover that you see here that has a lone central figure. And Baldwin objected to this cover. He felt that it was a stereotypical depiction of a black man and he thought it distorted the um, purpose of the novel and the message of the novel. 
So the first edition um, came out with a completely different cover design, which you see in the center. It's really, really different. It has a very different feel um, and it figures different aspects of the novel thematically. Grosset and Dunlap, the edition that you see on the far right that came out in 1956, is uh, Grosset and Dunlap were a reprint series. So after something had gone through its initial run, publishers like Knopf would sell off their plates to Grosset and Dunlap, who would just then reprint it and repackage it as a paperback as part of their universal library series, which was contemporary authors who had received a, an amount of critical acclaim. And they uh, repackaged it yet again with like an even different cover that Baldwin had nothing to do with whatsoever. Um, the reason that I wanted to bring this example is that we don't actually have a first edition. And it's really interesting to me that what we've chosen to, um, to privilege is um, essentially the thing that Baldwin himself rejected. So the version of the novel that we've chosen to collect and the aspect of it that we've identified as special is explicitly what Baldwin rejected as not being part of the narrative that he hoped to put forth about his own work. Can we go forward one more? Um, so I wanna end with this uh, quotation that is from a book called Placing Papers. It's a really wonderful overview of uh, literary archives collecting since 1955. And in the opening uh, chapter, uh, the author Amy Chen writes that a market's power is shown by what it prevents from changing hands. In other words, the value of our collections is as much defined by what we have chosen to collect as what we've chosen to exclude. Um, in saying we won't collect this, we're making a claim about the value or lack of value of those materials as much as we're making a claim for the value of things that we do include in the archive. Um, so I wanna end there and turn it back over to Nadia. We have about two minutes before my scheduled time is up. So if anyone has anything they wanna jump in and say or question, I can also open it up to that. All right, thank you guys so much for um, letting me speak here. Thank you, Liz. That was great. I really appreciated the imagery of the Baldwin books. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and take a, a quick break. So we have about um, 15 minutes before we start our next one. Does that sound cool? Okay.
Hello. Cool. It's 9.45, so we're going to move into our second um, presenter, um, which I'm excited to introduce Don, um, because I feel like that question of, of what is this thing and how much we say about it and how we talk about it is um, absolutely colored by the way that we look at the world. And so um, Don is here to talk about how that works in the library. Are, are you ready to get started, Don? I am. Cool. Take it away. All right. Um, I am going to share my screen and let it out of um, get it out of this view. <laughs> okay. So, and I am um, going to actually turn my video off. Um, but hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice break. Oh, I'm still not in, I'm still not doing what I'm doing. Okay, actually, Nadia, can you actually, Nadia, actually, can you control the slides? I'm sorry. Yep, no problem. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. But anyway, um, while Nadia is getting that up, um, so again, um, I am Dawn Lucas. Thank you for that introduction, Chaitra. Um, and I really enjoyed um, Liz's remarks about um, how materials um, make it their way into the library. And so um, now that we've talked about that, I'm going to talk about um, how you'll find them. So as Shetra mentioned, I'm part of the technical services staff and part of what technical services does is to describe materials so users can find them. Um, so Nadia, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so first let's talk a little bit about catalog records. Um, and so um, I, I know a lot of you know about catalog records already, so humor me a little bit. Um, and I know uh, many of you might remember um, the card catalogs um, that are pictured on the left. Um, and if you remember, each drawer was filled with catalog cards that contained information about materials in the library. Um, there is an example of a card at the top of this slide. Um, you can actually still find this catalog card in the card catalog in our um, research room um, right now, if you go down and look for it. Um, but although you can still find these card catalogs in some libraries, they have now, of course, largely been superseded by online catalogs. And so on the right, you'll see a screenshot of our current UNC University Libraries homepage um, with a search box that gives you results for online catalog records. And the catalog cards and the online catalog records um, have the same type of information in them, and they serve the same purpose to help you find the materials you need in the library um, in a pretty concise way. Um, so next slide, please. And you can see that if you do a search for James Baldwin in our online catalog, um, that we do have uh, a lot of materials here at UNC, um, some of which Liz um, already spoke about. And next slide. And then if you drill down a little bit further, um, what, when I drilled down, um, I got results for 43 items that are located here in Wilson Library. Um, there, so there's 35 items in the rare book collection um, and eight in the North Carolina collection. Next slide, please. And so let's um, just have a little bit of audience participation, make sure everyone's paying attention. I know uh, um, a lot of people here actually work in libraries, so maybe, um, maybe don't be the first to answer here, um, but what types of materials do you expect to find in the library catalog when you do a search? Um, you can just um, type in the chat box, um, don't think too hard, Books. Thank you, Shetra. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, articles. Yeah. Movies. 
cereals. Yes, Megan. So Megan works with cereals. Um, sound recordings, photos, comic books. Yeah. Okay. So these are all good answers. Good job, everyone. Um, so um, a lot of what was um, put for the answers here are published materials. And so I would say typically um, when people are searching for materials in our catalog um, for, for UNC libraries, they're looking for published materials um, like books and serials. Um, and often these materials are located at more than one library. So if the book you're looking for is checked out at one library, you might be able to get it at another library um, through interlibrary loan or just going to a different library. Um, next slide. And so one more, um, what type of information do you expect to find in those catalog records? Um, so that you know what the item is. Yeah, so excellent. Author, title, publisher, location, date of publication, call number. Yeah, all right, good job, everyone, once again. Um, you're, you're off, the, whether they're checked out or not, yeah. Um, okay, so you're off the hook for audience participation for the rest of um, my talk. Um, but then uh, we'll compare your answers with um, what my answers are. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, uh, pretty much with, we talked about most of these already. So the title, the author, the publication information, um, which includes the name of the publisher, the date of publication, um, the place where it was published. Um, subject headings, I don't think anyone put that, but that's an important part of catalog records. Um, and then other information such as the number of pages, the call number, um, if it's available, where do you find it? Um, you know, we have a lot of libraries at UNC see you need to know which one to go to um, and then other notes so let's look at an actual example so next slide please and this is actually um, the um, record for um, go tell it on the mountain that Liz was talking about earlier um, so this is just the top part of the record. And so you'll see that it includes this information, title, author, publication information, call number, where to find it. It's in Wilson Library in the rare book collection. The availability, um, it's available, but you have to come to the library to see it. You can't check it out and take it home with you. And then next slide, please. Um, and then you have the, the subject headings, the number of pages, the genre, and other information, um, such as this is the one that's the advanced proof copy with the cover design that was rejected by Baldwin. Um, so, you know, since catalog records were designed with published materials in mind, um, and those published materials are going to be located in different places, presumably, um, they have a, a standardized, fairly consistent level of description. Um, so other libraries that have copies of this book will have, for the most part, the same information in their catalog records. Um, now, will you find some catalog records with more detail than this one? Um, yeah, you will. Um, but what you see here, um, I don't think is vastly different than what you would see in other records. Um, but to be clear, there is subjectivity in catalog records, um, particularly when it comes to the subject headings. So whereas a lot of the information in the records comes directly from the item, um, is rather straightforward and pretty non-negotiable, um, such as the title, the author, and the publication information, catalogers determine the subject headings. So in this example, you can see that there are five subject headings listed. And um, for instance, one of them is a he the heading for African-American families in Harlem. Um, so that is a subject heading that whoever cataloged this book um, chose to include, um, but it's possible that someone else um, who cataloged this item might have not included that heading for whatever reason. So um, you would wouldn't have had um, the access point to Harlem. Next slide, please. Um, so here's another example. 
you'll see that UNC has three copies of Nobody Knows My Name, More Notes of a Native Son. Um, so there's two circulating copies at Davis Library and one in library use only copy at Wilson. Um, notice that there's a note that's just included for the rare book collection about a restriction. And then next slide, please. And um, here's the bottom of the record. You'll notice that there are fewer subject headings here than for Go Tell It on the Mountain. There's only two instead of five. Um, I don't know why that is, um, but you know that's so there's a little bit less access. Um, uh, subject heading access for this item than for the other one. Um, and you'll also see that there are more notes that are specific to the rare book collection copy. So next slide, please. Okay. Um, now, even though I said that when we talk about catalog records, um, a lot of people are typically thinking about published materials, uh, as many of you know, that's not always true. Um, so you can also find catalog records for our archival and manuscript collections in the library catalog. And materials in these collections tend to um, be unique, um, unpublished. Um, you're not going to be able to find them in another library. Um, so on the right side of the screen, you'll see that one of my search results is for the Trudier Harris papers. Um, which is listed as being an archival and manuscript collection. Um, so let's talk about those now. Um, next slide, please. So here's an example of the types of materials that you uh, might find in archival and manuscript collections. Um, I'll give a quick disclaimer that these materials are not from the Trudier Harris papers. Um, uh, this is, um, but, but they're materials from another collection, other collections in Wilson Library. So what you see here are um, you know, letters, photographs, slides, promotional materials. Um, collections might have audio visual materials, um, you know, video cassette tapes, audio cassette tapes. Um, there might be journals, diaries, scrapbooks, maps. Um, so just a variety of materials. A collection might consist of just one or two folders or it can include hundreds of boxes. So when archivists describe these materials, they're usually not describing on an item level like they're doing with books um, because uh, there's usually just too much to describe at that level. So what we do instead is to prov provide a description of the collection, um, highlighting what we think are the major topics and maybe calling out materials um, that we think researchers might find particularly interesting or important. Next slide, please. Um, so let's go back to the Trudier Harris papers. Um, when you open the record here, you'll see that there are a lot of similarities to the catalog records um, for the books that we looked at earlier. Um, so the title of the collection, um, the kinds of materials it has, it's located here at Wilson Library. Um, you have to come here to see it, you can't check it out. Um, there's the call number, um, which is what we really refer to as the collection number, um, the author, or uh, what we are really referring to as the creator of the materials, um, which in this case is Trudier Harris. Next slide, please. Um, and here's the bottom part of the record. Um, so there's subject headings like you saw on the other records. But you'll also notice a longer summary um, about the Trudier, about Trudier Harris and the materials in her collection. Um, and if you were to click on that little show more arrow, arrow you'd see that there's more written there. Um, you'll also notice information about the size of the collection and a note letting you know that the materials don't have any restrictions. So you can come in and see the entire collection. Next slide, please. Um, and so here's a list of the types of information that we just looked at and the catalog records for these types of materials are still rather uniform, although perhaps a little less so than for published materials. Records for some collections might include a lot more subject headings than um, other records for other collections. And as I mentioned earlier, assigning subject headings tends to be um, the most subjective part of cataloging. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, and one thing you'll see in these catalog records that we didn't see for the books is a link to the finding aid for the collection. Um, finding aids. All right. So now let's shift our focus away from catalog records to finding aids. Um, next slide. Yep. Thank you. Um, and maybe you don't know a lot about what a finding aid is. Um, even, even if you work in a library, you might not know very much about them. Um, that's okay. We're going to talk about them now. So a finding aid is a tool used to describe archives and manuscript collections, um, which again are unpublished materials. And um, finding aids, they used to be um, like typed documents. Um, that were either typed on a typewriter or on a computer and printed out um, that researchers can consult when they visited the library. And so at Wilson Library, there used to be, be binders full of finding aids in the research room. And the photo in the top right corner is the table of contents um, for a quite lengthy finding aid. Um, this is from the Paul Green papers. And you can see it's more than 300 pages. Um, so many institutions, including UNC, um, have their finding aids online now, so you don't have to look through binders. Um, and like catalog records, they're designed to help you find the materials you need. Um, so on this slide, you see the very top portions of two of our online finding aids, one from the Paul Green papers and the other from the Trudy or Harris papers. And I'll give you a brief background about these collections and why I chose them for this presentation. So Paul Green, um, was mentioned earlier, um, was a white author and playwright from here in Chapel Hill. And his collection includes or correspondence with many authors, um, amongst others, Langston Hughes and Richard Wright. And Trudy or Harris is a black literary scholar and intellectual best known for her scholarship on black literary figures, including Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, um, and also for her studies of Southern black identity and experience. And she is currently a faculty member at the University of Alabama, but she was previously a faculty member here at UNC. Um, so it makes sense that these collections are here at Wilson Library. Um, they closely adhere to the collecting focus on the American South. Um, but you know, James Baldwin um, is not from the American South, um, as I don't think he lived in the American South, as far as I know. Um, and we just don't have very many materials in our archives and manuscript collections um, about James Baldwin. Although, as you've already seen, we do have other materials about him. Um, so there are materials about James Baldwin in the Trudy or Harris papers, um, which Aaron, I believe, is going to talk more about later. Um, but based on the description of the Paul Green papers, I honestly don't know if there's anything about James Baldwin in his materials. There might be, um, but if there is, um, it's not obvious. Um, so that collection is more of a, if you like this, you might also like this recommendation. Next slide, please. So here's my list of the types of information that you'll find in finding aids, um, which looks pretty similar to the list I showed you for catalog records. Um, but you'll notice two yellow stars on the right side of the screen. Finding aids include a detailed description about the collection's creator and contents, and also often includes a container list, um, which is a list of what's in each box or sometimes what's in each folder. Um, now you might recall that the catalog record for the Trudy or Harris papers included that summary field that included a description. So you might wonder why I'm calling attention to it again. And I'm doing that because since many finding aids contain considerably more description than what you'll find in catalog records, um, recall that 300 plus page finding aid on the previous slide, um, is, um, you're not going to get that much information in the catalog record. So finding aids have, tend to have a lot more detail. Um, and unlike catalog records, the amount of detail included in finding aids can be highly variable and subjective. Um, some finding aids are very long and they include lots of detail about the collection and some are short and they don't do much more than letting you know that the collection exists. So they're not all 300 pages long. 
Um, details included in the finding aid might be based on an archivist's interests or expertise. So for example, an archivist who knows a lot about James Baldwin would be much more likely to highlight materials about him than an archivist who doesn't know very much about him. Archivists also often rely on details provided by uh, the collection's creator or donor. So if they didn't mention James Baldwin and the materials about him aren't obvious, um, those materials might not get mentioned in the finding aid, even if they are in fact in the collection. So the next several slides compare the finding aid for the Paul Green papers to the finding aid for the Trudier Harris papers. Um, spoiler alert, I'll let you know up front that the Paul Green finding aid has a lot more detail than um, the Trudier Harris finding aid. Um, and it's not because um, we like Paul Green more than we like Trudier Harris, um, but because the way archivists describe collections changed from the time the Paul Green finding aid was written to the time the Trudier Harris finding aid was written. So we're going to take a look at the differences and then we'll talk a little more about them. So next slide, please. So um, first we'll take a look at the subject headings listed for each collection. On the left is a partial list of subject headings for the Paul Green papers, um, meaning there's more that I couldn't fit on the slide. And on the right is the complete list of subject headings for the Trudier Harris papers. Um, and you'll see that um, there's nothing about James Baldwin um, or he's not called out um, specifically, um, even though we know that there are materials about him in the collection. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide compares the biographical notes for the two collections. Um, again, I couldn't fit the entire note for Paul Green on the slide. It's really rather lengthy. Um, and the note for Trudier Harris is considerably shorter, and it's pretty much the same biographical information I read to you a few minutes ago. Next slide. And similar story here for the note um, describing the contents of the collection. Um, I did get most of the Paul Green note on here this time. And then next slide. Um, so, and then finally, you'll see that the Paul Green papers um, includes a lengthy folder list of uh, more than 4,600 folders. Um, it is a big collection. Um, and the Trudier Harris papers has a much less detailed box list. Um, so both of these finding aids, I think, actually achieve their purpose. They let researchers know that the materials exist and they provide context for the materials so researchers can determine whether they're interested in requesting them. Um, but next slide, please. Uh, let's talk about why there's so much more information in the Paul Green finding aid. Um, and again, it's not because we like Paul Green more, um, but it has to do more with when these collections were described. So that first red arrow uh, that you see at the, near the top is pointing to the year 1998, which is when this version of the finding aid for the Paul Green papers was written. And at this time, archivists were more likely to describe collections um, with a lot of detail, um, which is great, right? Because more detail provides better access for researchers, right? Right? Um, well, this is a little bit of a trick question. I would say yes and no. So um, it provided better access for collections such as the Paul Green papers um, that were being described, but provided no access for other collections um, that were in the backlog and not described at all. So in the 2000s, there was a shift in the archival, archival profession, including here, with an emph emphasis on unhiding undescribed collections. And the rationale was that providing some description for collections, even if it wasn't like the description of the Paul Green papers, was better than no description at all because you don't know what we, we don't, you don't know if we have something if we haven't told you that we have it. So the last red arrow on this screen is pointing to May 2019, which is when the finding aid for the Trudier Harris papers was written. So well after we started providing less description. Um, and the, but the middle arrow indicates that more materials were added to the Paul Green finding aid in the 2000s. And if you look at that finding aid uh, more closely, you'll notice that the description for these editions is more in line with the description in the Trudier Harris finding aid than in the rest of the Paul Green finding aid. 
Um, I'm going to come back to that last paragraph you see on this slide in a few minutes, um, but next slide, please. Um, but just because we now tend to provide less description um, doesn't mean we always have to. Um, so we choose to provide more description when warranted. And right now we have been putting an emphasis on providing more detailed description for collections with BIPOC creators. Um, so here are some excerpts from the Melinda Maynor Lowry collection. Um, Lowry um, is a historian and documentary film producer and is also a member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. Um, so we've provided more description than what you saw in the Trudy or Harris finding aid. Um, and next slide, please. And here's the contents list. So we don't have, um, the, a folder, a numbered folder list. Um, we're doing it on the box level. Um, so we didn't assign folder numbers, but each folder is still listed. So next slide, please. And we're also providing more description for materials recently donated by retiring Congressman G.K. Butterfield, um, who throughout his life has served as a civil rights activist, lawyer, judge, and a legislator. And so you see him here reviewing his materials with Shetra um, and also university librarian Elaine Westbrooks and Chancellor Kevin Guskowitz. Um, now, what about those Trudy or Harris papers? Um, we're also going back and providing more description to collections that fall into this category. Um, so we will go back and provide more description um, to the Trudy or Harris finding aid um, in the near future. Um, and um, you know, we might add subject headings to, and description to make it clear that the collection does in fact contain materials about James Baldwin. Next slide, please. Um, and so while I'm talking about this emphasis on description, I'd also like to mention the library's conscious editing initiative, which is an effort to correct injustices in the way language is used in archives and manuscript collections. Um, and the conscious editing initiative is part of the library's larger reckoning initiative. Um, so here's an example of how we are applying these initiatives to the to finding aids. Um, in the finding aid for um, the Thaddeus Ferry papers on the North Carolina Federal Writers Project, you'll find this note. Um, Select documents, titles, and description found in this collection contain harmful and racist language used by the creators of these documents. Titles and descriptions provided by creators of the collection are indicated with quotation marks. Some of these original titles and descriptions contain harmful language. In 2020, archivists removed transcriptions of the harmful portions of the titles from the finding aid and replaced them with the term racist slur in brackets. The original titles and harmful language remain on the physical documents and digitized access copies. Um, and then you'll see, um, we, we continue on to say that um, we have not removed um, some other racial terms because we feel that they provide important historical context about the materials and who created them and that they facilitate the research process. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here's an example of where we did this um, in the title for folder 20. Um, and just to reiterate, we didn't alter the language on the actual items, just in the description. Um, you'll see that this uh, item is digitized. So if you want to know what the racist slur is, you can click on it and see for yourself, or you can come visit us and see the physical item. This is a decision that UNC has made. There are some libraries that will not edit description in this manner because some researchers um, search for racist terms to find what they're looking for. Um, we recognize that these original titles can provide access points, um, which is why we chose to keep other terms. Um, but we also think that altering the description creates greater accessibility to a wider audience by removing language that might prevent people from achieving their research goals as a result of being confronted with violent language by surprise. Um, and we're willing to accept this trade-off. And then Nadia, if you can go back a couple of slides um, really quickly, I know I'm about out of time. Um, yep, right there. Perfect. Um, so you'll see um, at the bottom, there's the paragraph 
um, saying since August 2017, we have added ethnic identities for individuals and families represented in collections. Um, and the reason that we've done this is that historically, um, you know, the, the collections in Wilson Library um, are, they tend to be very white collections. They tend to be about white people. Um, and historically, when we've described collections, we have called out individuals um, who, who aren't white. So you, know, you would say Trudier Harris um, is a black scholar. Um, but, if there are, but if someone was white, um, they wouldn't get um, called out. So there was this othering in our description. Um, so if you remember when I um, introduced both the Paul Green papers and the Trudier Harris papers, um, I said that Trudier Harris is a black scholar um, and Paul Green is a white playwright. Um, and so we're trying to, um, you know, not other people by calling them out um, when they're not white. Um, but to include identities for everyone. Um, and so I see that I am out of time and um, you get to have another five minute break. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Don. I really appreciate the way that you have kind of given us a baseline of how description works and introduced the idea that um, librarians are authors of catalog records and finding aids, and we have a choice about how they appear. So um, I'm looking forward to diving into that more in our Q&A um, portion. So thank you. <sighs> All right, y'all, we will be back at it at 1020 um, with Aaron Smithers. Thank you. Wow, that went by fast. <laughs> All right, here we are at 1020 for our um, third session with Aaron Smithers. You ready to go? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. So I'm going to switch out the screen share. Does that look okay? Do you still see, do you see uh, the same? Sorry, did it just change? There it goes. Right on. Um, okay, um, thanks so much, um, Dawn and Liz, um, um, for, for kind of setting me up um, to talk about uh, how, we, how we might use these items. Um, so, you know, I, first I want to, um, I have a tendency to kind of overcomplicate uh, simple ideas, um, but use really is, is not that simple. Um, it really just, there's so much that depends on, on how someone would like to use something. What does it mean to use something in a library? Um, I got really hung up here, which is kind of a tendency and it caused me to kind of spiral, spiral around and not really understand what I was wanting to talk about or do. But I mean, does it mean reading it? Does it just mean reading it? Does it mean analyzing it? If you don't learn um, anything, did you not use it? Um, a lot of people come to archives to use things um, uh, for other creative works, for documentaries or an exhibit, or sometimes people want to quote things in a book, or some people want to use things for very personal reasons. They want to learn more about their family or their personal histories or local history, or maybe someone wants to use something to revise or correct a historical untruth. Um, there are all different ways that people come to the library and come to archives. Um, to, um, to use something, right? Um, but use could just be looking at something, right? I mean, we can just appreciate something for what it is as a material object. And this is partially just an excuse for me to show you um, more fun things from the archives, but I hope you'll just take a second and look at these um, objects. And I'm, I'm, I'm lucky as a research librarian, you know, I get to explore 
many different parts of the collection, right? I'm responding to questions that people are asking, which takes me to many different places. And it gives me kind of a, a it offers, you know, research like myself, an interesting perspective of the collections and the kind of the collage um, uh, 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 Dr. Zaborowska um, wrote about uh, Baldwin's collages a little bit in her book and just kind of thinking about that collage. So just some, some items from the collections, like how can you imagine using these? Just, just let your mind go wild. Um, photographs of uh, uh, ballet um, Jimenez Vargas from Spain um, on their first uh, US trip in 1957, dancing in a basement at a party afterwards in New York City from the Photo Sound Associates collections. Um, in the Ronald D. Cohen collection. Um, a 1969 flyer for a screening of The Seventh Seal. Um, I really like the graphic design on this, but that's not the only reason it's here. It also has notes on the back from Archie Green's um, trips to um, Tennessee and to Kentucky um, to, um, to explore the um, Merle Travis as he was researching Merle Travis. And here we have a map, a, uh, a map, a hand-drawn map um, of Merle Travis's childhood um, area, his neighborhood. So, you know, what could we do with something like this? Um, a 1687 London English language publication of the Man of La Mancha. Um, a series of folk voice tapes. These were like uh, kind of radio shows, except they never aired on the radio. They were produced by individuals and then traded around the world. Um, you know, different individuals would send one tape to another person who would send their tape to another person and on and on and on. Um, and then finally, um, because, you know, technically this talk is about finding James Baldwin and Dawn talked a little bit about how, you know, that can be a challenge um, in, in Wilson Library um, because we haven't actively collected around James Baldwin. Um, but I did, you know, do my, do my job as a researcher and, and, and try to dig into those collections and hear just a couple of photos um, from the Black Student Movement of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Records. Um, this is in the university archives. And I'm, I'm fairly certain, although this is not credited, um, that this is his November 12th, 1984 keynote speech at um, Human Rights Week. He was the keynote speaker for Human Rights Week in 1984, um, which may be one of his only visits to UNC Chapel Hill, um, although I'm not 100% confident about that either. Um, so yeah. Uh, you don't have to put this in the chat. I actually can't see the chat right now. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll just um, just to re-encourage you to think about all the different ways that you could use these materials. And you know, as we, um, you know, I'm going to break break up break apart the kind of the rest of this presentation to talk about the kind of the two different ways that research and instruction librarians here at Wilson, the way that we try to help people use materials and. We do that through teaching, through our um, teaching and instruction programs, and then also working individually with researchers, you know, either remotely, um, you know, through email or certainly in the research room. Um, so, kind of go to um, teaching. Um, we have a, 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 an increasingly robust um, instruction program here at Wilson Library. Um, we teach, you know, uh, upwards to probably 100 classes a year, I think. Um, across many different subjects. Um, you know, some of these classes um, are just, you know, uh, initial visits for people to kind of get exposed to the library. Some of them are deep dives into um, particular subjects or themes. But in all of these instruction sessions, you know, we, we ground our teaching in a, um, in, in a goal um, of instruction around primary source literacy instruction. And, um, you know, that work is largely, um, we, we kind of construct that work and frame our teaching um, according to the primary source literacy guidelines as outlined by the Society of American Archivists. Um, we've kind of distilled some of those ideas into the values that, that we um, here at Wilson, um, our, our, our research librarians think about, like we encourage students to think critically um, to, if possible, relate to history on a personal level. So we're starting to think about belonging and identity, um, grapple with complexity, uncertainty, and contradictions. Um, you know, it's an opportunity for them to think about approaching act academic writing more creatively. And finally, um, as an opportunity for them to synthesize different types of information and resources. And that's something that special collections are, um, are especially capable of doing because as you saw before, um, you know, we have so many different kinds of formats and so many different um, kinds of, of pieces of objects and information from different people. And when we put those in conversation with one another, 
that can kind of lead us to new ideas. And so we're trying to encourage that through our teaching program. And one of the ways that we do that, and, and I think that we'll try to do that together right now, if possible, is, um, is we try to get students to think about analyzing a document, right? How do you look at an archival object? How do you go to the archives and get a folder or a box or a photograph? And what do you think about it? What questions can we ask of that? So I'm gonna go back to the Trudier Harris papers. Um, you know, we looked at the catalog record for the papers and a little chunk of the finding aid, but this is what the finding aid looks like. And I, I should have taken another screenshot here, but if we scroll down to the description, you know, we see in this, in this, uh, in the abstract here that, that Baldwin is here, which makes sense to me because Dr. Harris um, is a noted Baldwin scholar, one of her first books. Um, I, it may have been based on her dissertation. I'm not sure. I should have looked into that. Is um, um, uh, Baldwin, uh, uh, <laughs> Black Women in Baldwin's Fiction, um, which was published, I think, in 1985. Um, so, you know, I assumed that there would be Baldwin materials in the Trudier Harris papers, um, and indeed, um, but however, the description of those boxes was simply boxes one through six, right? So six boxes, not exactly sure where that material might be. So going to pull the boxes, looking through them, finally find here in box three, and this is what you would get, um, what a researcher gets if they come to the research room and request box three, or this is the box, you know, we may have out on the table in a classroom, and you open the box, start to look through, we see, you know, Dr. Harris's folders, right? We see a lot of her work on Toni Morrison, which also Makes sense. She did a lot of work on Toni Morrison, but in the middle of this box, a single folder about Baldwin. It says Baldwin. Take out that folder, put it on the table, and open it up. And you know, this is really what a student would see when they come into our classroom. You know, we've probably already pulled out the material that you know selected a folder out of a box for them to look at and review. And now we're going to ask them to kind of look through that folder, but then take some time spend time with one of the one of the pieces and kind of analyze it as an archival document. So here we see it looks like, you know, in this she's she's you know lining up her quotations for probably that book. Um, this folder also has you know photocopied articles that she used for research, letters from other Baldwin scholars who she wrote to, like, can you tell me about this? And the person writes back, I actually didn't write about that. Um, and then a lot of handwritten notes. And this is where um, we can spend a little time just together to do you know, a document analysis together. And so if I was gonna pull this for a class, you know, generally try to look through those papers and kind of find something that um, they can spend some time with and look at. So if you wanna look at these in more detail, you can open up one of these websites. I tried to make the URLs pretty easy. So if you just wanna look at the two documents, you can open go.unc.edu slash Harris. And then, there's too many people here, or maybe it's we're right on the edge of too many people for a Jamboard, but one of the ways that we do this remotely um, is using a Jamboard. So students can like close read the archival document and they can add their comments to the Jamboard, but I'll walk you through the same kinds of questions. Um, we also, you know, sometimes we use uh, worksheets, you know, we'll print out worksheets, um, but, um, or, or just have students kind of work in small groups with their own individual items. If you want to look at those more closely, again, you can go to go.unc.edu slash Harris to look at those papers. So we're going to start this document analysis exercise. And, you know, the first question that we ask them, which a lot of times, you know, the students kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of surprised because they think this is such a simple question, but it really is very important when we're talking about archives and we're talking about special collections, because we really do want to think about the materiality of the object, right? The materiality very much informs the kind of information that's available to us. So what kind of document is it? Is it a letter? Is it a diary, a photograph? And how does the form influence the information it contains and our understanding of it? So, I mean, we can try to answer that question. You can put something in the chat. Again, someone, I think uh, someone else will have the monitor if it's in the chat. Um, but yeah, we'll just take, I'm going to just take a couple minutes here and like let you, if you want to open that document, go.unc.edu, kind of look at these more closely, and then we'll come back and like think about these questions just for a little bit more, just like two minutes, it's 1034.
So I'm going to come back because I'm probably going to run out of time, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, ho hopefully, if you are able to go, and thank you for putting the links in the chat, um, Chaitra and Maria, I appreciate that. Um, if you're able to look at the document a little more closely, I know the one on the right for our for our screen, if you're looking at it, is probably a little bit difficult to read. But yeah, I mean, you know, trying to what what are these? You know, um, I think that might be a little bit of a challenge for some students to determine. But you know, if we have a basic understanding of Baldwin and a basic understanding of Harris, we can start to understand that these are the documents of a scholar, of an author, you know, starting to formulate their thesis, right? So on the left, you know, we have um, you know her kind of laying out what become the chapters of the book and an iteration of it that's scratched out. And then you know, one of the great things that I've noticed about um, uh, Dr. Harris's papers is that she she was very good about dating um, things, so we kind of know what days that she's working on things. And then the one on the right is um, is the uh, uh, um, notes from a, a now I'm forgetting the author's name, but a, a famous book that is a collection of interviews on Baldwin. It took me a little while to figure that out because there's so many pages, um, so many pages listed here. You know, it's like it's not an article; it must be a book. Um, but it's a it's a um, had the title and now I'm totally blanking it. Uh, the Furious Passage of James Baldwin is probably what the name of this book was from. So we get start to start to get a be better understanding of what these items are and then we can start to understand a little bit more about what Dr. Harris was working on and maybe discover some information that we could use into our further research on Baldwin, whatever that may be. We don't still really have a solid research question. Kind of move on through our document analysis to something that a little more easy and this can encourage students to like look at a catalog record or look at a finding aid right so who made it right we can you know we have a pretty good understanding that dr harris made this but in some collections you know collections could be made by many people and they were collected by an individual that was then delivered to the archive we asked people to consider the audience um do we know anything about the creator's life? How might that impact, impact our assessment of the source? So what do we know about um, Dr. Harris's career or maybe her scholarship? And how might that affect what we understand what these papers might be? What was it for, right? What, when was it made? How was it intended to be originally used? And here we're starting to try to get the students to think more critically about the, 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 the content of the information, right? Um, you know, who was it intended to be for? And that, you know, particularly for even older documents, that can also be a challenge and, 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 and um, getting them to understand um, how they might ask questions uh, of these materials. Um, just going back to it so we can see it again, you know, how was it intended to be used? Well, clearly this is probably only intended to be used by Dr. Harris as she was writing her book. Um, I don't know if there were other other uh, other re other reasons that she had in mind, but I don't think she had a co-author or anything like that. Um, and then uh, how does it, you know, now we start again, making kind of like a larger, opening the circle even more, why is it here? And Liz, you know, talked about some of these things a little bit, you know, but how does the document relate to the rest of the collection? There's only a single Baldwin folder I found in all six boxes. So it was, you know, early in her career. Um, maybe didn't, you know, went on to different paths, largely writing about Toni Morrison. Are there other connections with other materials in the collection that add to our understanding of the items? So we're starting to think contextually of this single object within the other objects. Why did it survive and end up in the archive? Who gathered and kept the papers? Um, all, all good questions. Um, and then finally, kind of the most complex, where we really start to get them to think about, you know, the archives themselves as a construct, right? So we're not just thinking about the objects and materials and like, you know, and considering them uh, uncritically as fact, right? We start to think about, you know, what does it mean? What is the most important information this item communicates? Is this type of information unique to this document? And then most critically, possibly what information is absent and what more do we want to know, right? Because, you know, on the research journey that we're hoping that they are going on, you know, that's this, these documents are going to lead them to something else. What more do they want to know? But what information is absent too? And like that kind of can allow us to start to think, you know, what people like um, Anne Gilliland and, and Michelle Caswell, um, you know, started to theorize, I think in, in, tw in 2016 about different kinds of archival imaginaries, which I still find to be, you know, kind of a difficult idea and theories are often difficult to get our heads around, but in archival imaginaries can be so many different things. Part of it is thinking about what is absent 
and not only what is absent do I want to look for, but what is absent and what does this absence mean, right? So we're trying to engender all these different kinds of ways of thinking, right, through a document analysis exercise with the students. Um, you know, we do similar exercises. You know, we don't only teach with archival materials. We're a special collections library. We have a lot of beautiful and wonderful and, and fascinating books in our rare book collection in the North Carolina collection. So we do similar exercises with those, although we might um, kind of change that exercise a little bit to concentrate more on, you know, the physical aspects on the materiality of the books, you know, what's its size, its paper quality, its font, its printing, um, you know, who was the intended reader, you know, all those questions. And I'm, I'm, Liz already kind of went through some of our earlier versions before, but we can pull these different books, we can pull other related, you know, we could do this along with the Trudier Harris papers, you know, another version of Baldwin. I mean, this one, you know, I, I, is, a, is, a, is a beautiful binding of the book, but it, you know, it has this <laughs> kind of very tiny um, autograph of James Baldwin on one single page. And I guess that's its significance. Um, but, you know, those are things that we can get students to think about and think critically about, you know, I, I'm, you know, I wonder which one would you prefer to read? I, you know, I, I don't know, it's something to think about. Um, um, <clears throat> we also, um, our teaching uh, covers a lot of different areas. We design learning modules for students to interact with, you know, so if we were going to design, you know, people can, uh, like what I was just talking about, looking at the materiality of the book, judging a book by its cover. Um, we have lessons on scientific illustration and writing, rhetoric, World War I posters, documenting student activism, and these are learning modules that teachers can immediately access there's digitized materials embedded within them and lesson plans developed for them to, to particularly use in, in, in first year writing um, classes here at the university. Um, um, also thinking again, like how do students then go out of a class and then use these materials, right? And here's a couple of recent examples of students doing um, intensive work with archival collections to develop then other digital humanities projects. And the Mapping Karen Parker's journal um, was a project led by Dr. Banu um, Goruksil um, and uh, Lara Lukabal, um, a PhD student in geography, as well as, as our North Carolina research librarian, um, Sarah Carrier um, to take an art, a single archival object, Karen Parker's diary of her time as one of the first black students, first black woman undergraduate student at UNC Chapel Hill and the diary that she kept here at that time, um, mapping that by finding other related archival materials as well as, as doing a ArcGIS mapping project. The Lercy archive was somewhat similar by, but by taking a single collection and thinking about um, a single collection of papers actually, but like writing and thinking about the history of the material objects documented in those papers of a, um, uh, um, a, a, a French Jewish man named, um, uh, uh, oh gosh, <laughs> I forgot his first name. George, um, George Lercy um, and, and his wife, Alice, who was from High Point. And so the students, you know, use those digitized materials in the collection to think critically about them, put them in conversation with any, each other, and then create a new kind of work out of that. So that's, that's really the, the primary way that we work with students in the classroom. But as I said, you know, a, a lot of the work we do as research librarians and a lot of the questions that we get about use um, come from researchers. And, you know, one of the ways that, um, let me, um, one of the ways that it's a challenge sometimes. Um, um, you know, one of the most kind of nebulous interactions um, uh, in the libraries is trying to determine what a researcher needs, right? What are their goals? Like, what are they looking for? And I mean, I think about research and I think about reference really as a dialogue and consultation, right? You know, these people are, are on a kind of their own research journey and they interact with me and like through conversation, we can perhaps get to that next step. Um, and, you know, when I try to end that conversation, I'm trying to figure out, you know, where are they coming from? And this is where, when I was reading um, The Me and My House, um, uh, uh, she uses this kind of triad of concepts that she lays out to think about Baldwin's work and his house in particular. And she's talking about matter, material, and metaphor, and space, story, and self. And on, on page 25, she starts talking about how, you know, these concepts function and this is a quote, as an animated rolling triangle with sometimes space, sometimes self, and sometimes story and attendant context appearing as a fulcrum 
thus demonstrating that like identity and language, the politics of social space are socially constructed processes that are always in progress progress, and always have material consequences. And, and that, that led me to reflect on the, the reference consultation process. And really what often I'm trying to do is figure out where is the person trying to come in? Are they, is the fulcrum balanced on themselves? Are they most interested in their sort of like personal history or personal um, or family history or like personal like geography? Are they more interested in kind of the broader story or in the context in which um, you know, they or something else happened. And space is a little bit challenging when we come to this tribe, but really what she's talking about when she's talking about space, she's talking about Baldwin's house, but she's talking and that, that's, that's analogous to matter, which is the physical object, which is an, an object or object. So sometimes people are just coming to look at the objects. And so, you know, determining what those goals are of that individual completely changes the way that we navigate our systems, our, our search and the, and the way that we help them. And it completely changes um, the, uh, the, kinds of, 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 um, the kinds of information that they may end up leaving with. And so, you know, continuing our research journey around finding Baldwin in the university, you know, kind of started with our initial search and turned up the Trudier Harris papers, you know, which had this limited um, folder in it. But, you know, for me, that led me to another question. And then like, how can we find, you know, maybe we're not gonna find Baldwin himself or his papers at UNC Chapel Hill, but we can think about um, what was his relationship to UNC Chapel Hill and how does that reflect possibly his relationship to the United States and possibly the American South? And then um, how does that you know, reflect on the history of a primary white university, um, primary white institution and how we have um, both taught and um, collected African-American literature and culture over time. So, you know, back to the Trudier Harris papers, I <clears throat> found a talk that she gave in the, in the, in the process of, 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 um, of, of writing her Baldwin book. And, you know, it was interesting to me that she's talking about here in the first paragraph, um, how he, he rarely ever, he rarely went to the South, right? Um, um, he, and he's right, talking about his book, uh, Just Above My Head, in which black folks in Harlem and a few of them who travel to the South, the places like Richmond Island and Birmingham, they go with all the myths about geography associated with how outsiders view the South. And then she goes on in this talk to really talk about how, you know, to not, to talk about Baldwin as kind of a Northern outsider who didn't really understand the South. And that's a reflection, that's how that's reflected in his literature. And so I thought that was an interesting idea, particularly again, thinking back to, um, uh, um, uh, uh, me and my house, um, where um, she, uh, the, the author is, is talking about how there was a lack of interest and a lack of scholarship involvement. And so, you know, I, Dr. Harris's work, you know, is somewhat of a, uh, um, a counter to that because she was very interested in working deeply in Baldwin at the time um, when um, uh, uh, the, the, the other author is suggesting that no one was. So, you know, I, I then turned to a, a, an excellent resource, North Carolina Digital Heritage Center. Um, you know, newspapers can be a way for us to track, you know, interactions of, of people and places over time to search for Baldwin and his times in North Carolina. Um, I, unsurprised to, to find um, a couple of things from the 1960s. And so, you know, this is sort of at the, at the one at the early height of Baldwin's celebrity. Um, he came and, and spoke at North Carolina College um, in 1963, but, you know, around that same time, um, and that was not at UNC Chapel Hill, although it was a, a brief advertisement in the Daily Tar Heel, in, um, in, in 1964, we see John Knowles, the writer of a separate piece, um, uh, UNC's writer in residence that year, and we see what he's commenting about Baldwin. Um, and I'll let you read it in the top corner. Well, I think that James Baldwin is a perfect example of a shouting preacher. He rambles on and on as if he's going to release the final word on something. And then somehow the reader misses the point entirely. Now, I don't know if you have read Giovanni's Room and then a separate piece, but I have a preference um, between those two and it's not John Knowles. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that is the sort of the public impression at least being presented at UNC Chapel Hill at that time. Um, you're know, going on um, seeing a, another article, the first article about um, 
uh, Blyden Jackson, Dr. Blyden Jackson, who was the first African American tenured professor at UNC Chapel Hill, and you know this is the the, the article celebrating his appointment. However, you know just the the headline alone um, is extremely um, disturbing to to me. Um, and, uh, and and this is 1969. So you know the first time that someone is sort of like asserting that Baldwin and other African American writers should be taken seriously as a point of scholarship on campus. Um, you know, there are interactions between, uh, there, 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 there are evidence of students, you know, reading Baldwin and sometimes reading it aloud, um, you know, to groups in the student union, um, but Baldwin doesn't, doesn't finally visit UNC until 1984. Um, he was scheduled to give the MLK um, commemorative talk in 1983. However, um, the night before he entered the hospital and um, was unable to travel to North Carolina that year, but he came back to keynote the um, 1984 human rights speech. And um, you know, that did make the cover of the Daily Tar Heel. But you know, looking around a little more, um, looking into the works of the Black student movement, Black Inc., um, their publication, you know, we see on the left, the advertisement for the 1983 talk. But what I was especially happy to find in this, you know, thinking about looking into other papers um, of, of, of professors and other um, scholars of African-American literature, particularly African-American scholars um, at UNC, I was really excited to find this editorial by um, the late Randall Keenan, um, one of our, 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 our um, uh, much missed professors in our creative writing department here at UNC Chapel Hill, and you know I, I rarely think about him as a um, as a undergraduate student. Um, you know I think about him as a professor, but he was an undergraduate student here. And here's a, a, another article where he is um, sort of defending Baldwin as someone who's who's desperately still important to students at UNC at that time. You know, we could possibly dig further into the Roberta H. Jackson and Blyden Jackson papers. Unfortunately, also minimal description in here, so not exactly sure where he may or may not turn up, um, or possibly an oral history interview. Um, you know, this is just kind of a very brief introduction into thinking about how we might uh, use the kind of tools available to us to find materials to then use our imaginations on how to use. And we'll be able to talk more about this and ask questions. Um, it's time for another break. And that was great. Oh my goodness, I have so many questions to follow up with you on in the, um, in the break. So uh, we wanna give everybody a chance to grab a snack um and and come back and and have us um kind of talk through some of the questions that these um presentation surface for us and um and also share any of the questions that you have and uh have have a good discussion uh, thank you so have a break we'll be back at 11.
Okay. All right. It is officially 11 o'clock and I have the distinct pleasure of trying to um, pull together some of the threads from what we've been talking about all morning, um, offer my own reflections and also ask some questions um, to the folks um, that presented ahead of us. So um, for those who might not know, uh, my name is Shaytra Powell. I am the um, curator of the Southern Historical Collection. And um, I'm really excited uh, to talk through these topics. Um, and I'm so excited that my um, colleagues are willing to engage in them with me because discussions of identity and belonging um, really fascinate me, especially in my role in the Southern Historical Collection. Um, I did want to take a minute before I jump into my thoughts and just talk about some of the highlights that I saw from the other presentations and, um, you know, especially for folks that are just joining us. And so to hear Liz kind of reflect on the, the ecosystem of special collections, collection development, and how our institutions and the legacies that we have can really impact the kinds of things that we can bring in. Um, everything from restricted endowments to, um, you know, our researchers and faculty members who sometimes have a distance from the, um, the sources that they're trying to describe. And, you know, Aaron kind of complicates that at the end with that impacts the kinds of materials we can make available to researchers. And so it really connects um, all of our, our work together. Um, when I was thinking about Dawn's work and the idea that, um, that librarians and archivists are active participants in the work of collective memory and building archives. Um, we're not just taking materials you know, to the researcher without any introduction of our own um, biases and um, perspectives on things. And, and how in this moment, we're really trying to prioritize um, our first time users or people who are encountering archives for the first time and try not to reinscribe some of the um, racist words or ideologies that might've been present in some of our older catalog records and finding aids. Um, so, and I think that's really important because there's still an overwhelming perception um, that archives are neutral and that the things that we're presenting um, do not have our, um, our perspectives baked in. Um, and then uh, I was just wanting to give another round of applause to our um, presenters for finding a way to incorporate Baldwin into all of our discussions. Um, that was something that kind of came out as we were planning um, that maybe Wilson Library does have something to say about James Baldwin. And can we talk about these layers of translation that all of our jobs um, interact with and still offer something to say about Baldwin? And I, I think that's such a treasure for the students and researchers that get to access our materials um, and also for, for sessions like this where we can um, kind of illuminate this uh, for, for general audiences. So, um, so all of that is good. I also just wanted to think a little bit more about um, Maria's introduction and the idea that we're kind of stripping away the artifice. And it's these ideas of neutrality. I mean, but obviously our predecessor, our predecessors have points of view. They made decisions about their work based on that. Um, they just cloaked it in archival science and this is the way to do things and there's this is the right way. And so for us to interrogate that and imagine, you know, what our experiences and our points of view have to say at this moment, put it in conversation and think about that for the, the next moment. Um, it's just a really um, important element of this moment in our field. Um, and this idea of getting closer to the truth that um, the more voices we include, the more perspectives we engage, um, the closer we'll get to um, describing our materials in a way um, that broader audiences can engage with. So, um, so I do want to read just a little bit of some remarks that I prepared just thinking about this topic. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, working in the Southern Historical Collection, a place that's 90 years old, and trying to understand um, how the records that were collected in the beginning can be reinterpreted and activated in ways that actually support uh, the voices and um, investigations into uh, new, new histories. Um, I think about the stories we tell about ourselves and what is our responsibility for building and describing collections that allow others to see themselves. Um, and when I think about belonging and identity, 
it's not just to talk about my experiences or to shame people for not including um, me or others like me, but I really think it's a paradigm to consider the work of libraries and archives. So um, when I was thinking about the question, it made it instantly made me think of 2014 when the papers of literary juggernaut Toni Morrison were received by Princeton University. Um, and for folks who aren't, you know, steeped in the world of library science or um, or archives, they might wonder why this is controversial, um, because she taught at Princeton for 27 years. They have access to, you know, archival resources. They'll care for the collections. The scholars will engage. Um, it seems like a done deal. But the complications really arose when the Moreland Spingard collection at Howard University offered itself as a plausible place for the collection. Now, um, you have to remember that Morrison was an alum of Howard University and a faculty member in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, her materials would be treasured by that faculty audience and local community who embraced her in her earliest years. And so, and that collection could have also been a catalyst for a much needed investment in that historic library. And so we have to ask ourselves, why did Toni Morrison um, think her collection belonged there? And did the identity of the institution matter? And I think um, Liz's comments about the Octavia Butler papers have a similar parallel into um, where the papers go, but at what cost? And so in a Huffington Post article from um, October 2014 titled, Do Morris's Papers Belong at Princeton or Howard? Journalist Chris Branch outlines the situation and cites Dr. Eddie Glad, who's the chair of the African-American Studies at Princeton University. And he says that he really wanted to interrogate the conception of community and Blackness that is making people so disappointed about the choice of Princeton and Howard. Now, he could be saying this because now he'll have easy access to these papers that are um, so valuable to his area of study. Um, and he, he writes about Black writers, Baldwin, in a big way. Or he could have a key insight about the narrow ways that we interpret the role and function of identity in our society. And so oftentimes when I'm reading things, it pings me back to other things. And so this made me think about um, a book of essays I recently read. Um, it's called A Measure of Belonging, and it's uh, 21 writers of, co of color on the new American South. And it's a volume that's edited by uh, Sunnell Barnes and it's available at Epilogue Bookstores. I literally found it while I was browsing a few months ago. And in the book, there's you know 21 essays. They have some really familiar names like uh, Casey Limon um, writes in it. Um, the woman who wrote Stankonia, gosh, I'm, her name is blanking on me. But uh, there were at least two that really helped me um, think about this complicated notion of identity. And in one essay, a writer named Aruni Kashap, Kashap, I think, um, in her essay titled, are you, a, are you a Muslim? And other questions landlords ask me. She talks about um, house shopping in Athens, Georgia, and someone asking her if she's a, a Muslim. And she's like, you know, don't ask people that awkward question. But she goes on to say she's a professor, she's a Hindu, and an omnivore. Um, and so these ideas of identity, um, how can they be exploded to, and, and complicated? Um, and one of the concluding comments in her essays was, um, don't white people like sunlight in their houses? And I just thought that was so perceptive because it, it kind of connotes that if you see a person as human, you have to imagine that they want the same visibility and recognition in the archives and everywhere else. Um, in a second essay that I'll cite here from Latria Graham, she talks about um, flooding in New Orleans and the idea that um, uh, black material culture is disappearing all the time. And she writes, I wonder how much black history we've, we've lost. First edition books, records from my father's tie at an HBCU, my mama's collections of the Obamas entering the White House. Black history is so fragile that I see anything tangible as valuable. And I'm crushed when I think of all that has been lost to disaster, floods, fires, and terror. And this was another um, kind of quote that makes me, it'll kind of lead to a question that I have for the panel where it's just, you know, how much is lost and how much do we worry about that? And what do we do um, with those notions since it is, you know, our primary responsibility to collect these items. 
So just returning a little bit to um, Dr. Glad and, um, and his book about Baldwin, um, Begin Again, which came out in 2020, and it centers the life and writings of James Baldwin. And in it, he quotes Baldwin's 1963 speech at Howard University, where he says, it is the responsibility of the Negro writer to excavate the real history of this country. We must tell the tr truth until we can no longer bear it. And I was thinking, you know, how identity is, is um, rolled up into this quote and also place, um, whether it's this country or Howard University. And it made me think that between, you know, he's identifying himself as a Negro writer, he's talking at Howard University, surely he can find a place here in America. Um, but as so many writers, including our guest of honor, um, well, not today, but the woman that we're referring to, uh, Dr. Zabrowska, um, she's exploring Baldwin's expatriate life. And we know that he struggles to find a place to rest or a place to escape in this country. And we have to ask ourselves why. And I think there's very tangible, and it's always this negotiation between these very tangible realities. I mean, we can talk about the endowments of Howard University versus the endowments of UNC Chapel Hill and try to understand what's happening here. Um, we could talk about some very you know, specific material realities um, and how do we interpret those things? Um, who do we um, engage to help us understand them? And so um, to close on a note that Dr. Glad like truly understand, and he underlines the importance of nuance. And though, you know, although discussions of identity can be polarizing and we're, you know, putting ourselves in these categories that can cut us off from the complexity of the world and the complexity of ourselves, um, we have to tell the truth about who we are. And I would argue that that note pertains to the individual as well as the institutions that we support. And so, um, you know, navigating that line is a big part of what we're trying um, to talk about with this discussion, um, but also what we're doing every day in the library. So um, with that, I will engage my colleagues here and some of some um, just important takeaways I thought uh, it would be good to hear from them on. And so the first one is about fingerprints. <laughs> You know, normally in uh, library science, we um, we talk about how we do not want our fingerprints on items, and I mean fingerprints kind of metaphorically. And so, when you think about your approach to the work, can you each kind of talk about what makes um, your approach different than maybe your predecessors or your peers? Um, Liz, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, maybe in the same vein of like this um, acknowledgement of the non-neutrality of libraries, I um, am a, a big proponent of um, taking a lot of ownership over the fact that decisions that I make are based on my particular background and that, uh, you know, I'm making selections and choices based on the information that I have and I have access to. So I'm kind of not afraid of leaving my fingerprints on stuff. I sort of assume that I will. And I hope that by being aware of that, I'm better able to be aware of my own biases and understand when it's time for me to step away from um, my own expertise and bring in the voices of others um, to inform how I'm making selections and how I'm making choices that impact my work. Um, Something that I think about all the time um, is, uh, it's actually something that I read in an article by an uh, archivist named Alana Cumbier um, about public services. And uh, they say, um, you know, from the point of view of a, of a patron at the library, the difference between um, the library doesn't have what I'm looking for, I can't find what I'm looking for, and what I'm looking for just doesn't exist in any physical or material sense at this library or anywhere is often invisible. That from a patron's perspective, if they don't find what they're looking for, a lot of times they just assume it, it, it isn't there. And um, that's always at the forefront of my mind is sort of like, you know, how can I provide it there for someone who's coming to the library, despite the fact that, you know, as I kind of mentioned in my presentation, I do think that there are 
ways that we have to scope our work and be honest about how the legacies of our collecting maybe disqualify us from being stewards of certain types of materials now, and that we have to be sensitive to um, what it means to be in our library space or be part of our collections and what the context of our collections has been and what it will be in, in the future and who our communities are. So anytime that we, that I, I or anyone else decides not to collect something, you know, am I making a choice that's going to mean that someone can't find themselves in some aspect of their being in the library and will that tell them something, um, communicate something about how we value their identity? Mm. Yeah. Um, I wonder, um, Don, if you think about that work and description of like what you want to bring to the table that um, maybe folks before you haven't. Yeah, um, so one thing that, you know, I mentioned our conscious editing initiative and, you know, one thing that we're really trying to do now is, um, you know, we are going back and looking at description um, that was done in the past, like maybe decades ago, um, that did, um, th this is the Southern Historical Collection. There's a lot of collections. Um, that are documenting um, the uh, land owning families um, in, in the South, um, you know, going back to um, the 1700s. Um, and a lot of that description really talks a lot about those families, um, you know, um, oftentimes in very laudatory language um, and downplays um, the fact that they um, owned enslaved people or the impacts of that. Um, and so, you know, we're going back and saying, okay, well, here are fingerprints of um, our predecessors, and we are going to add our own fingerprints, and we are going to um, do some redescription um, to, um, you know, make it clear that we don't think that, um, you know, owning enslaved people was benevolent. Um, you know, we want to highlight um, materials that um, include information about enslaved people that could help um, you know, genealogists or other researchers. Um, and so those are very, um, you know, conscious decisions uh, about leaving fingerprints on our work. Um, you know, we could decide not to do that. Someone 30 years from now could come behind me and my colleagues and make different decisions about the work that we've made. Um, so uh, the future us, um, so that that's some of the impacts of, of our work in technical services. Yeah, I wanna circle back to the idea of being iterative, but I, I do wanna give um, Aaron a chance to share how you, you feel like you're impacting your, your field. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that one of the real challenges <clears throat> is, um, uh, you know, there's been a there's been a, a major shift <clears throat> in 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 people's understanding, the general public's understanding of archives and what their and, and their availability, right? And and it's very different to work with different kinds of publics than it is academics. And you know, traditionally Wilson like was mostly working with academics, mm -hmm. and you know, so the research questions, you know. Um, that people ask sometimes require kind of more research than we're able to put into it, right? Um, and that varies a lot, you know, and like Liz was saying, like kind of where we are in our, in our own personal lives and, 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 and available resources like that week, right? Like how much time do I have to spend on a research question? And we try to do this equitably, right? We don't wanna give certain researchers like more time or more effort than others, but sometimes things is more discoverable than other times. And it just results in like a more robust response. And I really worry about things like that, right? Um, because like, basically I'm making those decisions for those people. I'm making the decisions about what's relevant and significant for them. Even though I try to be expansive about that and be like, here's an entire folder maybe you wanna look through. But I mean, like ultimately I'm making those choices, you know, in the similar way that a curator is doing. And, and I, I think that's a problem. And I try to be honest about that. But the reality is, is that people can't, a lot of people can't come here. They can't visit, they're too far away. 
there's a limit to what's possible there. So that's one way. I also am really worried about, you know, the access to digital collections and how that results in repetition of materials being used over and over again in, 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 in documentary projects and books, you know, we're kind of reusing the same evidence as opposed to actually going deep into those collections through research and, and imagining what else is possible or really exploring those kinds of archival imaginaries that people like Anne Gillen and Michelle Caswell and others, Sophia Noble are also all talking about. Um, you know, so, I mean, I, coming from folklore as a background, um, you know, I, one of the things that was challenging in my education was just, you know, really kind of an understanding of different kinds of values, right? Like understanding other values as valid and real, right? I mean, it seems simple, like we all kind of say that we do that, but it's really hard when we're thinking about like people's belief systems, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, I, I try to think about that when people are asking me, when, I try to think, I'm getting way off topic now. Um, the challenge of like authenticity in current archival studies, right? That's another kind of shift in archival studies is right off the, the kind of idea that authenticity or the provenance of an object is what gives it its power. Mm. And like, we're challenging that in many ways now. And so like, I think I try to use kind of my training in folklore to like make that very, very applicable as I'm thinking about these other kinds of challenges that I was just talking about. Yeah, um, that note about digital objects, it almost, it remind, it was reminding me of those conversations about catalog records and books that, you know, some people might say those are like less squishy in terms of description or understanding, but they introduce a different set of challenges in terms of, um, you know, overuse or not being completely understood. Um, I see you shaking your head, Liz, do you want to talk about cataloging <laughs> secondary sources? Yeah, I, no, I mean, um, one of the things that we talk about a lot in, I, and there's lots of catalogers who are in the audience today, so I apologize in advance if I am uh, being imprecise, but catalogs are relational databases. And so, you know, one of the, the concepts that's, that comes up in um, cataloging, whether it's rare materials cataloging or any other kind, is that you need to be able to agree that something is called this in order to create search access. And um, language is not that way. People have different ideas about what names are correct, um, how they name themselves and how versus how other people name them. They have different ideas about what to call topics. And also language changes over time. And we've seen this again and again that you know, descriptors that we used to commonly apply to certain groups then we at a later date say, actually those groups find that offensive or they've evolved a new way of understanding themselves and communicating their identities. And, um, you know, the more marginalized your identity already is, the more that can be true. But if you're trying to take a step forward collectively, that is to say, you're not just talking about your local description, you're creating a database that's shared as most library catalogs are amongst a bunch of institutions, then you have to be able to evolve standards. And so the, it's a, it's a, uh, that idea of iteration um, is hard. It's hard to iterate when you need consensus and there may not be consensus. So there's, there's a lot of stickiness, I think, in catalogs and what they do. And um, it's, it's not a new problem. And it, it, in fact, you know, uh, I mentioned in my talk, Dorothy Porter Wesley, you know, she was one of the earliest people to um, speak publicly and write about how classification systems in libraries were um, problematic and demeaning for black writers. You know, she pointed out that the Dewey Decimal System only had basically two categories for all of black culture. And one of them is slavery, and the other is um, I couldn't I can't remember off the top of my head, but basically, like if you weren't talking about slavery, you couldn't talk about black people. And she evolved her own system of classification at Howard in order to combat that. Um, uh, Native communities in the United States are another example of a community that has a long-standing opposition to the ways that catalog records describe their communities. Yeah. Yeah, I can also think of um, 
examples from um, queer communities where the way that they're described and where and where their material lives on a shelf is highly controversial. So yeah, I mean, I, the way that the, that queer communities have described themselves only in my lifetime has changed. You know, my my own ability to communicate with other queer people is constantly evolving, and you know, how do you keep up with that? Yeah. Thank you for introducing that um, complexity. Um, so um, I was thinking about this question. Um, uh, let me give you a little more context. You know, reading different things like, oh, our institutions are failing, the media is failing, the government's failing, libraries aren't what they used to be. And so this like um, kind of a road, it's not an erosion of standards. I do not believe it's an erosion of standards, but this interrogation of standards um, and how it's being understood by library science students and how it's, you know, how we're trying to train the generation of librarians that are coming after us. Um, how do you think um, librarian education could be um, reframed to stop with the focus on neutrality? Um, do you, does anyone have ideas about that? Like, what does that mean for the, the training and even perception of libraries, um, some of the work that we're doing? I feel like um, especially a burden to respond to this because I do teach a semester long course in the library school here at UNC. So I think about this a lot. Um, and uh, I think that it's about revision, maybe to go back to this concept of iteration, but um, maybe this is like my ethos in general as a librarian and as a human being, but you have to make choices you have to make the best choice with the information you have and you have to be willing and humble enough to say the way that I have thought about and done this in the past is, is different or my um, understanding evolves and be willing to go back, um, not just and change your um, approach or actions, but go back to the drawing board completely and um, throw out your assumptions and reimagine. Um, I've been doing that a lot basically since COVID, I think that COVID really actually provided me with a lot of space to step back from my work and say like, what are the things that I've always assumed are the place to start? And how does the place that I start when I'm teaching um, kind of set up a set of values that maybe are unexamined by me? And how can I start somewhere different? How can I frame the conversation so that um, you know, I'm not approaching things in this tokenizing way of like, and also this happened, but instead really radically rethinking what it means to talk about information and knowledge and culture um, and the ways that librarians and archivists um, interact with those concepts. Yeah, that's a great point. On a similar note, I'm wondering how we get better. Like what are our strategies for trying to do our work better? Um, I don't know, if, Don, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know if I have an articulate, or articulate strategy other than, you know, starting with, um, you know, just the baseline, like we are archives and libraries are not neutral. Um, like we're just not, going to even accept that as a premise um, to start with. Um, and so then if you become aware of, you know, everything that you do, every choice that you make, um, that that is going to have an impact um, on the materials that are that come into the building, how they're described, how they end up being uh, used by um, researchers, whether they're students in classes or, you know, scholars who are coming in. Um, so I don't know if, if um, you know, just acknowledging that, um, you know, we're, that we're just going to throw out this whole concept of being neutral, um, you know, if that's, if that's a strategy, um, then, mm -hmm. then I, I think that's where we should start. That should just be established at the very beginning um, that, that, you know, we're not, you know, this passive neutral institution that's just, you know, handing over books and boxes and materials to researchers. Yeah, I, I think that's important to acknowledge that it's um there's not a silver bullet, there's no easy way to kind of and I shouldn't even say like clean up or get better. I mean that 
I think we have all acknowledged that the people after us will probably do things differently. Um, but how can we, you know, in this moment with our, you know, compass that we can define as an organization, um, try to get some alignment between, you know, what we say we care about and, and what we're actually doing um, in our jobs. And so, um, I was just thinking, Erin, just reflecting on your presentation and how you were able to pull so much information about Baldwin and how, um, you know, there is a value in what's been done before, you know, being able to retrieve things um, is a skill. And I wonder um, how you get better at it or how you try to, um, I don't know, iterate in that work. Um, um. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, or even do, you know, do your consultations inspire you? Like, have you ever like, you know, talked to someone and then thought about something differently? Oh yeah. I mean, of course, thank you yeah. for helping me by reading yeah. my question slightly. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, uh, like a lot of things and research comes from experience. And I mean, I think a lot of experience for me, um, you know, comes from working with researchers, right? I mean, they ask me questions that I can't answer. Um, because I don't have that knowledge, right? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to have some subject knowledge that our library is strong in. So like, that's always enjoyable too. Like someone asked me a question, I'm like, oh yeah, I, I really know a lot about that subject. This is relatively easy for me, but I don't wanna fall back, like I said, on like kind of reproducing the same content over and over again. So that in itself is a challenge, right? Um, but I mean, I think that's the, that's the, that's the primary way um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think a lot about, I mean, from maybe a little bit outside, I mean, I just to the other question about neutrality too. I mean, I, I you know, there, uh, we are, we are, we are actively engaged as we have been for probably the entire existence of this country in culture wars and, um, you know, doing public cultural memory work um, is really challenging to navigate those systems when we want to ensure that we are able to maintain at least like the basic services that we currently offer. Um, you know, it is a, that is a complicated thing to do. And um, it is important to take strong positions and stances like, you know, that we are not a neutral institution and that we are not a neutral um, construction, um, but we have to be conscious about how we communicate that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm thinking a lot about like writing grants lately. And so I, that's something that. Yeah, um, I think I'll ask one more question and then turn over to the audience questions. But I, um, I am struck by the dialogue in the um, Zabrowski book about, um, uh, you know, offering material objects to an archive and that archive holding a line of like, we will not be taking materials. And, you know, on one hand, I can respect the archivist for having a boundary, they're making a choice. Um, but on the other hand, you know, what is the power of these three dimensional objects? Um, and how does material culture um, figure into the archive? Um, I don't know if you all have thoughts about that. I know with like where books kind of complicates the narrative of like, what is a book? Um, if you want to weigh in on that for a minute. Yeah, I mean, that is a, like, there are tons of categories of things that fall under the broad structure of, like, the world of rare books where that sort of challenge our notion of there being an easy distinction between book and not book. So, you know, many artist books, I saw an artist book once that was a, a box full of Leiden jars. Like, is that a book? They called it a book. You know what I mean? But even then also, you know, we have things in the collection that are documents of, writing and communication that either pre or um, uh, overlap with uh, like the Western book as we know it, things like epigraphy and stuff like that, they are more object-like in terms of their care and preservation, um, but they are more book-like in that they are objects that are meant to be read and they communicate written ideas. Um, I mean, the thing that is really interesting is that the objects, you know, sometimes are so wonderful in exhibition scenarios. 
<laughs> because it's sort of like you're on, on your day to day, you're like, oh, I don't want an object because it doesn't fit into our classification systems. We don't know, we're not the experts in housing and describing artifacts. You know, we're not museum professionals. There is an entire, you know, professional area that um, learns how to care for, preserve, and provide access to and interpret objects. And that's a big reason that many archivists and librarians don't want to collect them is that they recognize that we're not the, the right um, group of professionals to do that. But then when you're doing an exhibit, you're like, man, it would be great to liven up this case full of books if I had an object. Um, and they can be really resonant. Um, uh, there are times where I'm really happy we have certain objects in the collection because bringing them out to show to students is um, just a really engaging way of kind of putting in context um, books and other kinds of paper-based documents in their material cultural lives as they were then. Um, so an example of that that I can think of is we have a phrenology skull replica that's uh, part of our um, history of medicine collections. And we've put it on exhibit. It's currently on exhibit as part of a larger book display, but it also comes out in classes a lot because it, it teaches them something about how to think about phrenological texts and treatises and how they were deployed in, in real life. Um, I, I wanna stop talking because I want other people to talk, but um, I, so I have mixed feelings. On the other hand, there are objects in the collection that you know, I question whether or not they have continued value. So things like statues of Charles Dickens that we acquired at some point in time. And, you know, are we really a place to be curating statuary? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't mm -hmm. accept things like that at the present time. Um, but we do have some things like that in the collection. Um, I feel like I'm also the context queen, but a lot of times objects do enter the archive in the context of larger collections, but as one-off decisions, we kind of wouldn't pursue them. Um, but when they come as part of larger corpuses of material, I don't want to say they like sneak in, but they have like a context within a larger group of materials than they would by themselves. So a recent example of that is we got a collection of shell books that are the history of the study of shells. It came with shell specimens. Um, I would not collect shell specimens in the abstract, but they have a context and a meaning with the books. Yeah, yeah that's, that's absolutely true. I was just thinking about the role of the curator to build that narrative and to explain why and how it connects. Um, I can think of projects in the SHC related to like um, coal mining communities and the, the idea that some of their implements or even um, artifacts of their domestic lives really add to our understanding of the oral histories that are connected alongside that. And so being able to tie it together and bring it together for researchers. And while you were talking, I was just like, you know, we live in a 3D world. Like, why would we only look at 2D things for um, trying to understand that world? And um, so, yeah, it's, and it's complica complicated um, because what notions of, um, you know, value do we put on people that are literate and people that have access to um, paper, ink on paper, um, and uh, how could collecting differently help us tell different kinds of stories? Absolutely. So there's a lot of reasons to, and a, a few reasons not to um, collect uh, um, 3D objects. Um, I want to pivot a little bit and let um, a couple of people um, from the audience maybe jump in to um, articulate their question. And um, actually, I just want to ask Pat Parker <laughs> if she's open to being spotlit and to kind of uh, transition us into the Q&A portion. Um, sure. OK. Do that. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yes. Well, first of all, I wanna say, um, yes, I'm, I'm Pat Parker. I'm director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities, um, where we will be hosting Dr. Magdalena Zaborowska, who's a Baldwin scholar, and she's going to uh, deliver the um, 2022 um, Reckford lecture. And uh, so thank you to uh, Dr. Maria Estorino and to you, Chaitra, uh, and all the presenters for doing such an excellent uh, workshop. This has just been wonderful. And the three hours went by so quickly. I was thinking a three hour workshop, really? 
And yes, really, it was, it's fantastic. So thank you. Um, so my, I had um, really one question and a comment and I put, put them both in the chat. Uh, the first one is to Dawn, um, you know, thank you for your excellent presentation. And um, when you got to the part where you started to talk about the, the decision-making process for uh, removing harmful language from the finding aids, I, I found that really fascinating and so uh, relevant to discussions in you know, the current public discourse around censorship efforts. And so I'm interested in hearing you uh, talk, you know, bringing this expertise. I feel like this is what we need in, in these moments is you know, people with expertise and experience and in in, in, in engaging with these uh, questions, these complex, uh, these complexities. So I'm interested in how the university libraries uh, in general, and you in particular, Don, can advance our understanding about the distinctions between your decisions, the decisions about, um, you know, labeling harmful language, and then, um, and, you know, distinction between that kind and that, that other that uh, focuses on harm and discomfort um, in other areas. I hope that's clear, but that, that's, that's my question. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I'll um, hopefully what I'm going to say answers your question. And just to clarify, um, so that decision was definitely like, um, you know, not a decision that was made by me. Um, so, um, you know, there are other people involved. Um, um, but really, um, the, the rationale behind the decision was that, um, you know, yes, there are, on the one hand, there is this, um, you know, community of scholarly researchers um, who might search for those terms and keeping um, those terms in the description helps to advance that research. Um, and on the other hand, there's this, um, you know, other larger community of, you know, um, undergraduate students, the general public, um, who um, maybe in the, you know, we haven't traditionally thought as being the primary users of our, materi our, our materials, um, but it's here for them too. And so, um, you know, we're, we're not looking at it so much as censorship, um, but as more, um, you know, if you are an, um, an undergraduate student, um, you know, in their first year and you encounter um, descriptions of our materials um, that have these racist terms in them, um, you know, maybe you don't decide to engage with those materials at all um, because you've just been turned off by this altogether. Um, so it's really, um, you know, we're, I think we're looking at, I, I don't know if trade-off is really the correct term, but, you know, this might make things a little more difficult for the scholarly researchers, um, um, but will potentially open things up and provide more access um, to other audiences who we haven't traditionally seen as being our primary audience. And uh, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, yes. And let me, I do want to make clear that I, I absolutely understand that the, what the um, finding aid in the example that you presented, it was really a, a, a process of, it wasn't censorship. I didn't see it as censorship. I thought it as curating. And I, mm -hmm. I guess I was thinking about the kind of rationale and, and uh, decision making that framed the decision, you know, this could be beneficial to sort of the haphazard, you know, white people shouldn't be made un, you know, uncomfortable mm -hmm. in hearing about a racialized past of US history, for example. Like that, the distinction between those rationales, I think, is very stark. And I just wonder, I just think that there would be a benefit for um, having that, um, you know, that, that um, um, point of view out there and, and that resource out, uh, available. Yeah, I think about that a lot too, in terms of, you know, especially for our reference and instruction librarians that they're having to bring undergraduates into the space and talk about like animal collections, for instance, maybe see harmful language and they have to try to figure out how to say, well, you know, we don't believe that, but it's up here. And it's like, well, why'd you write it if you, if you know it's wrong? And so, you know, how can we 
try to put it in our, um, you know, our finding aids and in our disclaimers and, and how can we just communicate that um, this is not the library, this is a past that we're trying to filter through all these, these lenses. So um, yeah, it's amazing work that's happening out of our uh, technical services department. Um, I know that there is a, a hand raise. Do you want to, um, is it Seja Wilson? Hi, yes, it's Seja Wilson. Um, I had a question that it kind of connects back to what was being discussed before about material objects. Um, I have a large interest in material culture. And so just thinking about the tension, I guess, between museums and archives um, and kind of the barriers between what is accepted into collections at museums versus collections at archives, to me, and it might not be, it might just be my perception, archives seem to be more for the people and of the people um, in different ways than museums do. And a lot of communications with the public for museums require um, ex exhibitions and things like that, which have their own curatorial barriers with what the, what the public sees versus what um, is available in their collection. And so I was just kind of wondering how, as archivists, we can um, mitigate the tensions between access for the public and making these things that are, that are traditionally um, made and um, created by people who maybe don't really interact with documents that are available at archives, like I'm thinking of people who aren't literate and to create crafts, to create um, things like that. And so like, how would we balance that and making something like that active, or sorry, uh, available? Um, I have some thoughts I could get started and if anybody wants to jump in. And um, I've heard similar reflections about, you know, people get suspicious sometimes <laughs> um, that they, they can only see certain things online or that, um, you know, even the archive itself with closed stacks, there is this kind of um, perception that um, maybe we aren't, and it's, you know, depending on what we're talking about, maybe we aren't telling uh, the whole truth of, of what we have or, or what we understand about it. Um, I think that one way that we're doing it is trying to think about transparency and the idea of um, collection level records for everything that we have to try to like surface the backlog. And so um, people could actually see a few subject headings and a short description of everything we have. So it's not like really hidden. Um, I'm also kind of thinking about the idea that maybe museum items are more heavily curated than archival items. And, and maybe that's what you're getting at in terms of seeming like there's more gatekeeping around museum collections and archives collections. Um, and yeah, I'm not exactly sure um, what to do about that. Um, I mean, one thing about archives that's really interesting to me is that we talk about the aggregates. Um, it's really hard to, to identify single pieces of paper that have everything that you need to know about them. And so, you know, trying to empower communities and, and people that want to access archives to understand um, the distinction that, you know, it's kind of more about the aggregate of your materials that are getting at a point rather than, you know, individual items um, that say something. So I don't know. I think it, it's in language and it's in access um, that there might be some, some strategies uh, to, your, to your question. Anybody else want to comment on this one? Yeah, I'll just say that um, one of the things that I think about a lot in my own collecting activities is where the Venn diagram allows us to um, make uh, un understand differently what our role is and what we mean by, say, a, a term like book or print culture or material culture or so on. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I feel like I'm constantly educating myself about is um, moving beyond a kind of Western understanding of literacy uh, in order to see more types of objects as part of a conversation about what um, you know, cultural history is or written culture. Um, there are lots of different types of writing that do not involve pen and paper, do not involve you know, ink and typography. And um, 
so that's like one of those areas that um, that I see as like an appropriate expansion that isn't about sort of um, moving into mu museums territory, but is about having a more um, inclusive and expansive and nuanced understanding of what we mean by collecting print history. Um, and then the other aspect of that is, you know, even within our traditional kind of collecting areas, um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, the print collection more or less. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we look at printed published items, but once you start looking for print beyond the book, you start to find it everywhere. And I think there are a lot of opportunities for us to think about, you know, what, what do we mean by published materials? Um, that could include it at Wilson Library, things like audiovisual materials, records, wax cylinders. Those are types of encoded information. They're types of publication and they're types of communication. But it can also mean that things that might traditionally be thought of more as objects are actually part of our printing history. So that could be things like board games um, that uh, include printing and that are part of understanding the uses to which print has been put to um, create a material life for people. So um, I don't know if that's like really a full answer to your question. I do think a lot that there are more and more conversations in the kind of glam professions about um, interprofessional information sharing. And we are at a place where we're starting to talk more about like how can libraries and archives and museums and galleries be better in conversation about our practices and, um, and having shared values instead of being sort of in our own camps. Thanks for your question. Um, Reed Rickards, do you wanna um, unmute and ask your question? Sure, hi there. First of all, I just wanna thank all of you panelists. This was really fascinating and a welcome uh, break from my regular course schedule. <laughs> um, I acknowledge that this question might be a bit too, um, it might be a, opening a whole different conversation that might be a little bit difficult to address towards the end of the lecture. Um, but I'm wondering if any of the panelists have any thoughts or advice for um, someone beginning their scholarship and really um, wrestling with identity, particularly right now um, as a white man, um, beginning scholarship on Baldwin, I think there's a certain level of trepidation um, or inadequacy that is easy to kind of feel. Um, and particularly as a gay white man, there's this sort of tension of um, relating to some aspects of identity, um, but not others and worrying about um, stepping into certain things or speaking on certain things that I don't have experience in. So. I was just curious if, if it's if you see if it's appropriate to the conversation if any of the panelists had any thoughts. And okay, <laughs> um, I'll start. I mean, I, I do think that uh, there are important parallels to what you described and what we're trying to do in the libraries. Um, and you know, me and Maria talked about this a lot, like that tension between being of a community and trying to be an archivist for that community and um, and that it's not easier in any sense. And so I think that that idea of um, kind of cultural humility and trying to understand um, the nuances of the culture that you're exploring um, is important. And it also makes me think about the way that we put identity in the finding aid records where we say this, white scholar was studying this black community and how it makes some people uncomfortable, but it really helps us have more of an understanding of what this collection is saying. And, and I, uh, I really resist the, um, the knee jerk reaction to say that this white scholar is completely outside of that community. Maybe there are ways that they overlap that are very authentic um, and it'll show up in the way the collection. So it's not an automatic like, observer, you know, um, exploitive activity. It's just an acknowledgement that, you know, a little sign of caution, this is what's happening here and now try to interpret it. So um, I think transparency and humility are probably big, um, I don't know, guiding words as you 
start your scholarship, but I don't know if others, I mean, this is like core, like how do you um, engage with materials um, that are different or the same as yours? How do you navigate that? I mean, this is maybe not helpful overall, but I mean, you know, I, I again, I was struck by um, Dr. Harris's kind of early scholarship that she was presenting in that paper, which was sort of, you know, presenting on Baldwin as an outsider to this to su the Southern African American experience, right? Um, so I mean, I you know, that's just to suggest that there's all many different ways to think about identity, and I mean, you know, I, I I'm not a Baldwin scholar, but read a number of his books and, you know, reading a little bit of Zaborowska's book, Dr. Zaborowska's book too, just thinking about, you know, a lot of his own personal experience was, uh, and, and, and writing was about contesting what it meant to be an American, right? And, and, and how, you know, navigating and imagining what, a, what, it, what it could be, what it actually could have been for him to be an American. And that opportunity was just, denied not just him but countless other individuals and so you know he's already grappling kind of with that question in a way that i think opens up an opportunity um uh yeah i, I mean and and i was reading a little bit of i was trying to think about just other ways to think about the uh, objects and thinking about the house and and there is i'm i'm totally gonna bomb this other name but it's it's like the, uh spivak uh, it was is it was a, it was a literary theorist, I think, and he was Gayatri like, Spivak. What's that? Gayatri Spivak. Yeah, that's it. Um, I mean, I don't know anything about them either, um, but he was quoting quoting La Chopra about fetishizing the archives, and I mean, that's something that I think about a lot because, like, I'm a collector myself. Like, my wife and I both like collect books and records, and so like. And, and like, that's probably one of the main reasons why I kind of eventually ended up in this field was somewhat like my fetishization of old things, right? And I'm like constantly kind of battling with that as well. And I think that, you know, recognizing that and thinking about it and being critical of it as you're approaching archival research into Baldwin um, can kind of help also navigate that, that, that challenging uh, kind of chasm that you're, that you're thinking about. I mean, you're being critical of it already. That seems important. Um, I don't know if Elaine or Pat want to jump in and talk about this question of intellectual freedom and how um, public libraries are negotiating it or academic libraries. I will absolutely defer to <laughs> Dr. Westbrook. And so um, happy to see you. Um, so, yes, yeah. Yeah. No, I've just been listening and learning so much. And I guess I had put that in the chat because. Um, yeah, I think there are some interesting questions about censorship and freedom. And um, particularly now, <laughs> as we mm -hmm. talk about critical race theory and the, um, you know, of course, this year and last year, there have been more books challenged than, um, you know, in the past 10 years. But we also have to know that censorship is as old as, as humanity. I mean, there's <laughs> always been, um, movements to censor libraries and librarians and teachers. And, and so we're in that cycle again. And it does happen in research libraries, um, but just not nearly as much as it's happening in the public and the school libraries. And I just think that, um, you know, it's people will often turn the selection and acquisition um, imperative into censorship, you know, and it's, and I don't see it that way. I don't, I mean, of course we make choices and there are a lot of things we never select for collections, but that's not censorship. And, but I do think in some cases it is censorship, right? Like I think mm -hmm. a curator or a selector is actively choosing not to buy something because they think it is not appropriate for, you know, it's obscene, it's offensive. Like there's, you know, and so it, it really is an interesting thing to think about. And I just feel like it's very nuanced. And I do know, at least since I've been here, you know, I'm pretty clear, like, you know, I, I get requests and it's just like, well, no, we're not, we're not taking that out. That That's, you know, we made the decision and this is an item that belongs here. And, and um, 
And so I also wanted to add more nuance to this idea that we have something to offend everyone. Like it depends, like if we're offending the same group all the time, that's a problem. So, mm -hmm. so I just think it's um, an important value of librarianship and archives and information professionals that we'll always be grappling with and fighting forever. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I was just reflecting that um, Baldwin is such an example of that, like what he meant to America in 1963 is not what he means in 2022. And so we need to, you know, looking historically and also looking at, you know, artists and writers and communities and to help us understand these things is, is really powerful. So, thank you. All right, does anyone have any last question before we, it's been a, a good morning, a long morning. Okay, well, I have been told this has been recorded. And so if you missed any parts of it, you can find it, the library's website. Um, we're gonna look forward to Dr. Zabrowska, I pronounce her name wrong, um, <laughs> lecture in a couple weeks. And we are all in Wilson Library if y'all are able to come visit us and, and check out the collections. So with that, I will close out. Thank you so much. <laughs>